Well, we're going to continue our study in uh, First Thessalonians. You know, as a parent, you want to teach your children to walk, right? And the first thing you have to do is get them to stand, right, before they can even walk. And Paul is a spiritual parent of these um, Thessalonian believers. And uh, in the uh, first two chapters of uh, First Thessalonians, Paul explains how the church uh, was born. He explains also how the church was nurtured. But now he want, he's very concerned in chapter 3, as we get into it, he's very concerned that they learn to stand and that they learn to stand firm, as it says in chapter 3, verse 8. So in the first uh, four verses of chapter 3, and we're not going to read it all here this morning, Paul explains uh, and expresses his deep love for the Thessalonian believers. And he knows that they are under incredible pressure. There's great persecution going on in that in that uh, city at this time towards the believers, especially coming from the the Jewish sector. Uh, They're very upset about the message that Paul has been preaching about Jesus Christ. They pushed him out of the city uh, because of uh, his uh, teaching about Jesus Christ. And they are continuing to persecute this group of believers in Uh, the city of Thessalonica. So Paul is writing this from Athens. He's been thrown out of the city. He's writing to these Thessalonian believers uh, from Athens. He can't get there for some unknown reason. We read in that portion of scripture that he is being prevented because of, he says, Satan. We don't know what is stopping Paul at that point in time. It could be an illness. It could be, you know, a you know, he's being compelled not to go into that uh, city of Thessalonica. So, but he's still very concerned about, it, about these believers. He's very concerned about finding out what is going on with those believers. And we read in verse 2 of chapter 3 that he sends Timothy to uh, strengthen and encourage them in the faith. And the need of <clears throat> constant strength and support <clears throat> is a vital part of Christian community. And I think sometimes we forget that, don't we? That we come here not only to worship God, but to encourage one another in love and good works. That's what we read in the book of Hebrews. So there is a constant need for us. It's a vital part of our Christian community to be strengthened and encouraged in our faith. And uh, we want to resist what our society teaches us that, you know, the independent person, the person that doesn't need anyone to help them is, is really the mature individual. But that's not the case for the believer. The mature believer understands their need of strengthening and encouraging on a regular basis. And when you think about it, The idea of needing support as a people is really at the heart of our faith, isn't it? Just think about that. Uh, Accepting our weakness and need of God is the beginning of our faith. That's the first step. You have to get to that point of saying, you know, I need to be reconciled to God. I need to have that relationship with God. I recognize I can't do it on my own. My works of righteousness, the things I'm trying to do to ingratiate myself to God, they don't work. I need God's grace. I need God. Uh, We need to understand our continued dependence upon the Holy Spirit and God's grace in our lives to strengthen us. And I think that is one of the most important discoveries that we can make as believers, as people. Uh, our need to be strengthened and encouraged. I think that might be the definition of uh, humility, that we have this great need in our lives. So that's the first thing that Paul does to reach out to these people. Uh, Or that's the first thing we read about in this portion of Scripture. He sends Timothy. But there's another way in which he is trying to encourage and strengthen these people, and we read about that in verses 9 through 13. And he is doing that through prayer. And I think that probably is the principal way. He's been continuing to pray for them, 
Now he has, um, you know, he sent Timothy, but I'm sure he sees prayer as a primary way to encourage and strengthen these individuals. And we want to look at that prayer. What can we learn again about prayer from the Apostle Paul? And the first thing we read in verse 9 is that he uh, thanks God. And again, we see this emphasis upon the grace of God that's being demonstrated, not only in the life of Paul, but in the life of the Thessalonians. And Paul is thanking God for the great joy that God has been graciously bestowed upon him as through the Thessalonian believers. I can't, uh, uh, we can uh, thank, we can't thank God enough for the joy he talks about in verse nine that he has. So he has his great joy that God has allowed him to have because of the Thessalonians. And again, we see thanksgiving right at the beginning of a, a prayer life. And in many ways, that should be at the heart of our prayer life, acknowledging the grace of God. And so Paul is standing there, he's saying, as a new parent, I'm so proud of what God has allowed to take place in the life of these Thessalonians. And we know what it's like as a parent when we see our children standing firm or growing or standing on their own two feet. There's no greater sense of pride we have, and there's no greater sense of sorrow that we have when we see a child who is stumbling in their walk, in their life, especially spiritually. So we can see why Paul has this great passion for these people and is praying for them. And in verse uh, 10, we see that there are four things that characterize his prayer. And the first thing is that it's habitual. He says he prays for them day and night. It's not spasmodic. It's not just, well, I think I'll pray for them today. No, he's praying for them day and night. So we see that this is a habitual, uh, hap or this is something habitually that Paul is doing in his life. We see that there is passion in this prayer. He talks about them. He's praying most earnestly for them. He's passionate. He's concerned about these people. And maybe that is another indicator of the of the effectiveness of our own prayers. How passionate are we as we pray for these people? Are we developing that passion by getting to know these people and the, and the situation? I mean, your hearts have to go out as you watched uh, what's going on in the Ukraine and you see these families broken up and you see children crying and you, your heart is broken and you have a passion for those people and what's going on and you're, you're praying for them and you're, you're hoping that God will stop this inhumanity that is taking place in that country. And we see uh, how specific he is in his prayer. Uh, we, uh, he's praying that we may see you again. He is not sort of saying uh, generally a general player. He has a, a need in mind. He has something uh, that he is praying about. And then we see that it is a selfless prayer. Not only is it specific, but it's selfless that we may supply what is lacking in your faith. He is deeply concerned about them more than he is about himself in this situation. And maybe that, you know, how many times are our prayers really a reflection of our selfishness rather than our selflessness as we pray for other people? That's what's bringing him great joy. It's not what's taking place in his life. It's what's taking place in the lives of these people. And he wants to see that continued and growing. And that's what's really bringing excitement. And there's nothing more exciting for me when I see uh, the people in my congregations or I've, I've been given responsibility over growing in their faith. And take, I mean, uh, you know, people will thank me for messages or things of that nature, what I'm doing. Well, the thing that brings me great joy is not what I'm doing, it's what you're doing. And when I see the student cafe, when I see people going out and handing out uh, door hangers, when I see people uh, participating in different ways within the ministry of the, of the church, it's the, it encourages me with great, uh, you know, it gives me a great joy to see that as a pastor. So Paul's carrying these people to the mercy seat of Christ, right, of God. He's seeking God's grace in their lives. Uh, and we don't know how much sin uh, 
has been, uh, we have been spared the effects of sin or how much temptation uh, we have conquered because of someone who is praying for us. We don't know that, do we? We don't, we don't understand that. And, and I'm one of these people, I'm a very task-oriented individual. I, you know, it's very hard for me oftentimes to pray because I say, well, I, you know, I, it's not like, you know, I can get up and give a message, okay, I've done this. Done. But when you pray sometimes, you think, well, okay. Does it have an effect? Does it have a power? Well, Paul says in, in, in his actions, in his life, yes, we need to continue to pray. We have no idea how many people have come to know Christ because of our prayers. We have no idea how much uh, pain and suffering and temptation has been uh, resisted in our lives because someone has been praying for us. I was reading the story of a, a lady who, um, who couldn't really serve in her church in the traditional way of serving in her church, you know, uh, you know being an usher or, or coming to services and doing this, that, and the other thing, or running a program or things of that nature. So she said, well, really the only thing I can do in some ways is pray. And so what she used to do, and, and this is just reading her quote, when I go to bed, uh, I take the morning paper, obviously this is, or maybe she today would take her iPad or something. Um, when I go to bed, I take uh, the morning paper to my bed with me. I read the notices of birth and I pray for the little babies uh, and ask that Christ would become real to them and that they would come to a saving faith of Christ. And I read the notices of uh, marriages, and I pray for those marriages that they may uh, come to a, a knowledge of Christ and be established upon Christ. And I read the uh, announcements of birth, and I pray for the sorrowing that they may be comforted in Christ. You know, I think sometimes no person uh, can ever tell how much of God's grace and power flowed from that ladies bedroom no one can tell how much power and grace has flown uh or has been uh flown because of the prayers of the saints here and i can think of no better way to serve christ than to make sure that we are in a, a habitual <clears throat> and specific prayer life so let's go on and just take a look at the requests that Paul makes. And he makes several requests here, uh, and that's found in verses 9 through 13. And the first request is that uh, Satan might uh, uh, not prevent him from seeing them. And again, the request is not so much for himself, it's for them. He wants to be able to go and help them in their faith. The second one is that uh, he may... He prays that God may supply what is lacking in their faith. That's what he's desiring for them. And uh, he talks about their faith many times uh, in this uh, portion of Scripture. Uh, and he's very concerned about strengthening their faith. And that word that is translated lacking or supply really means uh, adjust. It means to equip it means to furnish, and it was used to talk about fishing nets, the mending of fishing nets. And we see a reference to that in Mark chapter 1, verse 9, where it just talks about the mending of the nets. So what's that, the idea behind this supply? Well, the idea is that our faith will never reach perfection. There is always need of adjusting, of mending, of growing in our faith as believers. You'll never be perfect in your faith this side of heaven. And that's kind of the idea here. And Paul talks about that in, in uh, or makes kind of a reference to that in Romans chapter 1, verse 17, where he says, we go from faith to faith. Hmm, wonder what that is talking about. Well, I think... Abraham is a, a good illustration of that. Think about the life of Abraham. He was called to this promised land, a land that is going to sustain his people, going to bring great blessing, going to bring uh, the name of God to all the nations. Great 
promise. And so he leaves Ur of the Chaldees and he makes this journey to this promised land. And when he gets to the promised land, guess what? There's a famine going on. Well, some kind of promise. <laughs> you know, you're taking me from Ur of the Chaldees where I was supporting my family and, having, and you bring me to this land that had great famine uh, going on in it. God permitted that famine to test the faith of Abraham. And unfortunately, Abraham failed. And you read that he went to Egypt. He went down to Egypt. Every time you see down to Egypt, especially in the Old Testament, that means they've gone to the world. They're, they're, they're not trusting God anymore. He's going to Egypt and he's gonna seek help from Egypt. But as we realize, each step of the way, God brought circumstances to bear on Abraham that forced him to trust God and grow in his faith. Uh, and as you all have heard probably over the years, faith is a muscle uh, that gets stronger the more you use it. And so we think about some of the problems that he faced as he was going along there. Uh, he faced the problem of uh, his nephew Lot. He had family problems. He had marital problems, no doubt about it. You read about the, the problems that he had with his wife and his handmaiden, Hag Hagar. Um, you know, sometimes the greatest step forward in our faith are backwards. Sometimes, you know, God allows us to go backwards in order to strengthen us so that we can move forward in our faith. And we know that the ultimate test of faith was uh, God asking Abraham to uh, to uh, sacrifice his beloved son, Isaac. So faith is like a muscle. The more you use it, the stronger it gets. And we need to understand that a faith that cannot be tested uh, is not a faith that can be trusted. So Paul says, I desire to strengthen their faith. That's his, his uh, first prayer request, that God would strengthen their faith. The second one uh, request is that their love might increase and overflow. You know, times of suffering are oftentimes when we become very self-centered, isn't it? Poor me, I'm feeling bad, I need, you know, need help. But Paul is uh, telling us here that uh, he's praying that in the face of all their suffering, that their love might increase and overflow. Doesn't kind of make sense, does it? In some ways, in a, in a, to me, sometimes it doesn't. See, what life does to us depends on what life finds in us. Do you ever think about that? And, and nothing reveals the true nature, the, the true nature of our relationship to God than than the furnace of affliction or persecution or, or problems in our lives. Nothing reveals who we really are until we are tested in some way, shape, or form. And the Bible talks about that in many forms. And some people build walls during times of trials, right? They shut other people off and, and sort of recede into themselves. Other people, and what Paul is saying here, is talking about building bridges and draw to others and to God and being drawn closer to others and being drawn closer to God. See, a growing faith in God will result in a, he's suggesting in here, a growing uh, love for others, especially in times of trial and trouble. That doesn't make sense, does it? I've got too, much, too many troubles to get involved. I've got to recede, I've got to get back. Isn't that our, our temptation? I see that all the time in people. I, you know, we're having family problems. We can't reach out. We can't, you know, uh, get involved in this. When maybe the answer is that you need to get out there. I remember the story about a, a pastor and, and some, a lady came in and was telling her about all the needs and how depressed and how awful he was. He says, well, I got the answer for you. Let's, let's go to your house. I want you to bake a pie. And I want you to take that pie over to this lady over here. And you know, that act of service changed that lady's perspective altogether. 
Well, there's several things we should uh, note about this love, and we've talked about it over the last few weeks. This is agape love, which is an unconditional love. It is a love that God has shown to us, and it is a love that he, ena- that, uh, he enables his children to express through the Holy Spirit. It's through the Holy Spirit, through God's grace, that we are able to express this love to other people. Uh, It's a a love that demonstrates that I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. That's what Jesus says. How will you know that I am one of my disciples? Or Jesus says to them, uh, you will know that you are my followers by your love for one another. So that is a distinguishing characteristic of a true believer. Uh, And uh, according to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And uh, this is not a sentimental, emotional love. It is a practical love. And we talked about that last week when we looked at Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, where it says, Listen, Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. And right after that, he says, how do you express that? By loving the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your might. That is how you express that. So this, is, uh, this love that he's talking about here uh, results in action and a demonstration of our allegiance to God. And if you think about that for, and if I am going to show my allegiance to God, I am going to carry on and love his agenda. And his agenda is God so loved the world. And he's reaching out in love to other people. That word listen, as we talked about last week, really talks, is a, really means doing. Listen, all Israel. It's that whole idea of these These words need to be understand at the level that they create a response in your life. If they don't uh, create a response, then you haven't really listened, right? That's what that word conveys in the Hebrew. Hearing and doing are basically the same thing. You have not heard me. You have not heard the word of God today unless it results in action in your life. Not my words, but God's word. Read over that scripture again. Read over it and see what God is teaching you from that. And so, again, how was Israel supposed to respond to hearing that the Lord alone is God? In that polytheistic culture, uh, that affirmation, that, that pledge of allegiance There is only one God. So how is that to be expressed? Love the Lord your God. And that's what we talked about. So the idea of listening and doing is bound up in the idea of biblical love. And in this context, it simply isn't that warm, fuzzy, uh, emotional type of love uh, that we may have for somebody or feel. This verse is teaching this that love will result in uh, acts of loyalty and faithfulness as a believer. So if I really believe there is one God, if I really believe the God that is being revealed in the scripture, I really believe in that God, that he is the only true God, it should result in love that expresses itself in faithful obedience. And we looked at the Shema last week and, uh, and talked about how in that prayer, it talks about if the Israelites really believe that God is one, they will love God. And the way they will love God is by keeping that covenant, by being obedient to God's word. And isn't that what Jesus teaches us in John chapter 15? Verses 9 through there. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments 
and remain in his love. And I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My commandment is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friend. You are my friends if you do what I command. You see the connection there? If I say I love Jesus but ignore his commands, well, the scriptures say no, that's pretty inconsistent. John teaches us in 1 John those three tests of faith. And one of those tests of faith is, um, do you love your brothers and sisters? If that is not one of your uh, characteristics as a believer, then you got to question whether you really have listened to God's word. If he really is uh, the one God. If you believe that Jesus is God, if you believe the grace of God has been expressed through the death of Jesus Christ upon the cross in order to reconcile you to God, then you will love him and you will love uh, others, believers, as he has commanded us to do. And again, this is not an obedient love or a sentimental love. It is uh, a love of obedience to his commandments. You know, our love for Jesus needs to be expressed in active obedience to his word. If I love Jane, the primary way I can express my love to her is not through cards and candy and, and flowers and things of that nature. I believe that the best way I can express my love for Jane is by obedience to the covenant I swore to God and I swore to her, or said to her, but I swore to God on that day we were married. And I express that love, not primarily through cards and candy and things of, you know, you might give, but I express that love by uh, valuing her, by listening to her. I value her advice. Uh, I acknowledge the value that she has. And in a sense, I obey what she says. When Jane is a, a gifted educator, when she tells me the girls need to learn this, I listen to her because I believe that. Jane is a, a, a gifted musician. When, I, hey, when she talks about music, over my head. And when she makes a recommendation, I listen to it. Bonnie, gifted in music. I'm going to listen to Bonnie. I'm not married to her, but I'm still going to listen to her. But Jane, I value her advice in these areas of my life. And in the same way, if I love God, I believe that he created me. I believe that his commandments are meant to bring joy and happiness uh, to make me the person that I was created to be. So I will listen to God because I believe that he is God. I believe that he loves me and his love is, to me isn't expressed in cards and candy. His love is expressed to me through Jesus Christ dying upon the cross. That's the type of love that is going on here. You know, I used to struggle with this whole idea. I don't feel these emotions. Some people talk about, oh, you know, I'm in love with Jesus and stuff like that. And I think, okay, why don't I feel that? Why don't I, you know, have that, you know, that feeling? But you know, the thing that convinces me I love Christ is my absolute commitment to him. Those feelings are secondary. They'll come in time. They only come through obedience to Christ. And that's what I firmly believe. It's our actions that create our emotions, not our emotions that create our actions. I don't feel I need to pray today. I know I need to pray today. I don't feel, well, today I'm going to obey God's word. I know I need and will obey God's word to the best of my ability today. That's love. 
And as you see how that obedience produces in you that peace that passes under all understanding, that joy, then there's a, a feeling of gratitude, of love, of thanksgiving for that, uh, for God. But I want you to almost also notice, I think one of the most profound things here, uh, it's all profound, but one of the things that really jumped out to me, this love is to be extended not only to our brothers and sisters, but it needs to be extended towards all men, including Vladimir Putin or some of these awful people that are doing awful things. See, he, and remember, these people are being persecuted. And Paul is saying, you know what? You need to express love. Your response to that persecution is love. You know? That's how you express love. You know, uh, how would, you know, we respond you know, when we are being persecuted? And so I think, you know, the best test, the real test is not found in how we love those who love us, but found in those who are very unlovely. Uh, found in, in how we love our enemies. Isn't that what Christ said to them? You know, you really love your enemies. Well, not just love those who love you, but love your enemies also. So perhaps the best measure of our love is found in our ability to pray for our enemies. Have you done that? When somebody has hurt you, when somebody has caused you great pain and suffering in your life, are you praying for them? I guarantee that if you start praying for them, you're going to start changing your attitudes and you're going to understand. See, God did not just die for those who would love him, did he? He died for all mankind. He sent, sorry, he sent Christ to die for all mankind. Some will not accept that. They will reject the love of God, the grace of God. That's their choice. And others will accept the Jesus Christ as, as our Savior and as our Lord. But God did not restrict his love just to one group of people. There will be people that reject it. It talks about his grace is experienced by all people in one way or another. Some people ignore it. And I know that, you know, uh, I've you know, bent over backwards to help an individual, and they've basically spit in my eye. Well, so be it. And that's what some people are doing to God right now. And they've rejected him, and they're going to pay the ultimate penalty for that. You know, separation from God, from all eternity, from his love, and that's the place that we call hell. So who is your enemy? Who has wounded you spiritually, psychologically, emotionally? Can you pray for them? Can you forgive them? I want you just to close off by, probably most of you have seen this, it's a testimony by Corey Tedboom. 